So uh, today I want to talk about uh, human reason and algorithmic judgment. So um, this is in the context of um, some new work that I'm starting to explore. So uh, uh, this work is uh, somewhat tentative and there are various different registers and, and uh, different elements that I'm going to start talking about today. And I'm still thinking through some of the kind of consequences and some of the kind of genealogies I'm drawing on. So I'm not uh, in any way claiming um, a, a clear trajectory necessarily in the way in which I'm putting these elements together. And of course, there are going to be emissions and, um, uh, and, and this kind of will be a, a nice, uh, a hopefully, possibility in questions where people can uh, make suggestions and, and comments, etc. So as a kind of context, and if you're familiar with my work, uh, you'll know this kind of question uh, runs through uh, many of the things that uh, I find of interest. But essentially, the question of uh, kind of how economic anarchy in advanced capitalist societies is combined with elements of rationalization and technology, particularly computation, and how those mobilizations and deployments of uh, various forms of technologies are actually um, constitutive of certain kinds of what we might call mentalities or certain kinds of subjectivities. And this question is of uh, kind of key interest to me because the work, part of the work that I am now uh, looking towards, part of my writings, is really around the questions of uh, knowledge and the questions of uh, rationality and reason in what we might call some sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, computational or algorithmic society, particularly in its institutional form. So um, my new work, for example, is going to be uh, interested in, in the question of the university, in the question of knowledge production in the university, in the question of various forms of practices, various forms of inscription uh, uh, related uh, to um, uh, various forms of um, knowledge work, cognitive work, shall we call it. So for me, one of the interesting questions raised by this connection between um, the economic system and um, uh, technologies and computation particularly, is the way in which instrumental uh, rationality is uh, deployed, is inscribed, and delegated and prescribed, but also given uh, a privileged status within the concept of rationality uh, itself, and in some sense become hegemonic of the concept of rationality. It becomes the definition of uh, rationality. Now, this combination of calculation, this uh, collapse of calculation and uh, a form of reasoning or uh, a form of rational thinking implies, therefore, that anything that is not countable, that is not calculable, that is not computable, is in some senses illusion or metaphysics, and therefore outside of the necessary uh, questions of what one should attend to and the practices one should uh, be involved in in this uh, particular constellation of ideas and constellation of practices that we find ourselves in uh, today. Now, of course, my work's uh, deeply influenced by the Frankfurt School and the uh, return of these kinds of questions of um, critical thinking and the deployment of critical thinking in relation to the ways in which um, cognition and calculation are in some senses augmented or delegated to these kinds of systems and modules, these kinds of um, software programs and services, um, raises questions about how um, certain forms of historical construction around reasoning are today taking place. Now here you can see direct connections with some of the previous speakers in terms of um, uh, the issue of education, the, educa uh, the, the uh, issue of, of practices, the uh, issue of institutionalization and intergenerational uh, communication of knowledge and of um, notions of um, civility and notions of uh, civil society and, and so on and so forth. And the extent to which these kind of calculative rationalities undercut, problematize, weaken um, this form of uh, social, uh, uh, social knowledge, social thinking. So we certainly see um, in our contemporary uh, existence, our everyday lives, for example, 
uh, and particularly in our professional lives, this drive to use rationalization, this insertion of certain forms of calculative and algorithmic ways of doing and thinking. And this, I think, speaks very much to many of the questions that have been raised uh, in the conference in relation to uh, the question of consciousness itself. Um, not necessarily streams, necessarily, um, but certainly in terms of the way in which practices of thinking are influenced, perhaps nudged, um, perhaps shaped, um, and so on and so forth. So we see, um, and people have already talked about this, and Nate, of course, gave us his wonderful um, key performance indicators. Um, but the, the notion of measurable indicator of performance, the fragmentation of consciousness, uh, standards of input and output, certain kinds of gestural uh, forms, and the uh, construction and monitoring and um, reinforcement of bodily uh, function, and, of course, the monitoring and surveillance that um, computation was always um, expected to actually be able to implement, but as Snowden showed us, was far more pervasive, far more advanced than perhaps we had uh, actually realised. Um, secondly, in terms of these systems, it's interesting there is a kind of lack of legitimacy around these algorithmic systems. I'm not really going to be able to talk about that, but I think that is an interesting question. The opaqueness of these systems, which of course relates, I think, to certain questions about how we understand those systems, how we understand the conditions of possibility for those systems, what those systems are capable of, and how one might form some conception of the limitations of those systems, right? How do we draw boundaries? Um, what are the regulatory frameworks? And so on and so forth. These are all very difficult questions because of um, the, um, the early stages of the, um, our experience of these systems, right? We've yet to learn many of the lessons, I think, that although there are historical examples of kind of ca catastrophic failure, of problematic uh, uh, encounters with these systems, as they become increasingly interconnected uh, and increasingly reliant, and systems are built upon systems and abstractions are built on abstractions, um, there is, of course, uh, the possibility of kind of larger structural problems. And these structural problems, I think, are uh, twofold. Uh, there's this kind of question of legitimacy and authority, I think, in terms of the deployment and actually the encounter with these systems, but also their actual uh, contribution, perhaps, to uh, moments of systemic crisis and danger system failure. And, of course, I'm kind of pointing somewhat towards uh, the 2008-2013 uh, uh, financial crisis, which I think does teach us um, about the dangers of calculative reason combined with a kind of rationalisation and computation uh, and profit-oriented uh, sensibilities, particularly corporations and individuals, right? These, these means-end rationalities, this instrumental rationality can very nicely fit with what we might call a kind of computational uh, uh, rationality. <clears throat> so um, we see a growing use of these computational systems. These systems model, they abstract, they simplify, they visualize. Um, they are uh, built out of generally pretty simplistic uh, causal and statistical models uh, by nature of the calculative requirements of these systems, i.e. that they calculate. It's important that they produce a result, a result that's actionable within a time uh, limit that makes the result helpful, as it were, or maybe unhelpful, depending on your perspective. But nonetheless, they have to deliver. And as such, uh, there's a requirement for these kind of performative uh, systems, these kind of uh, results generated uh, speed and acceleration. I won't uh, go over Chris Anderson's argument. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. And I think it certainly speaks to the conference in that there's this notion that uh, we are now post-theory, that data, the pure uh, uh, imminence of data is able to do all the work, carry the heavy weight of uh, theoretical interventions and thinking and modeling and so on and so forth. So we let somehow the patterns emerge um, from the uh, data itself. So that's the kind of context, and that's really taken up a, 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 a too large a portion of my talk. But uh, essentially, what I wanted to introduce, and I will only really be able to introduce uh, today just because of the limitations of time, is um, 
my interest in the way in which particular deployments or particular ways of asking uh, questions around computation are indicative or in some sense paradigmatic both of the question of computation itself and calculation and calculative reasoning, but also whether those questions have implicit within them the kernel, as it were, of an already existing computational rationality. Right? And in this sense, it's important to ask who it is that asks the questions. Right? And I think that's a very interesting element of the way in which computation is problematized and, prob uh, and contested. So here, um, to kind of um, uh, 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 to, to frame this, I want to think through the question of whether it is possible for every aspect of human thought to be computable, right? How that question is mobilized, right? And how it is used to critique, critique computation. Now, there are two kinds, of questions, two kinds of reasons why I'm asking this question. So the first is really, is that, as I said, is this a kind of paradigmatic form of questioning? Um, and is it, in some sense, representative of, or some, in some sense, um, an exemplar of a kind of uh, questioning? And that that questioning itself may not be sufficient if it may nonetheless be necessary. The second question, uh, or uh, uh, element of how we might think about that question, is whether the deployment of that kind of question is in itself ideological. In that, I think there is a moment of obfuscation about more serious questions that are raised by computation and calculation and so on and so forth. And in this um, presentation, um, somehow I'm going to try and get to the section where I think that comes to the surface, right? So how the abstraction of that, shall we call it, ethical question around computability and human thought in some senses distracts us maybe perhaps from uh, more important uh, interventions. So um, similarly to Caroline, I've been returning to uh, Weizenbaum um, because I think Weizenbaum is um, kind of an interesting thinker um, and uh, 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 you know influential in uh, 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 particular circles in relation to this question, the question as it were, which is his question about the reduction of uh, human reason to calculability, to computation, to computational systems themselves. <clears throat> so, of course, um, famously, uh, the book Computer Power and Human Reason from Judgment to Calculation was published in 1976. And this book had quite a profound impact, I think, in the way in which it set up the questions, in the way in which it was able to speak to a mixed constituency of readers. Um, to the contributors and influences that run very strongly through the book, um, and the way in which the question itself was set up uh, at that time, right? 1976, it's very much the beginnings of very intense attempts to implement automation and automatic systems based on computation, the cutting edge, as it were, of automation and computation around um, a kind of liminal area between uh, manual automation and cognitive automation. There was something very interesting about the kinds of things that were happening, I think, in the 1970s, as computation was more confidently able to be deployed in places where previously it was thought not able to have coped. So, uh, in short, Order really, this is the kind of question about the extent to which, shall we say, uh, human reason is logic, or better, the kind of logic that is contained within computers and mathematical formulations, and how that may then become paradigmatic of thought itself, right? That kind of strange reversal that Weizenbaum was certainly 
concerned about. So, <clears throat> Weizenbaum had, um, uh, 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 as many computer scientists, an experience of industry. Uh, he had the experience before he went into um, academia. He was a, a professor at MIT, of course. Um, and he worked on um, a very interesting um, project, I think it was called um, IRMA, at the Bank, at Bank of America, working for SRI, uh, rather interestingly, uh, Stanford uh, Research Institute, as it then was. And he was involved in the uh, problematic of a kind of paper information overload that was created by paper checks. Paper checks had become increasingly popular, and Bank of America, as with many other banks, were having very serious problems processing these checks. These checks, of course, were written not just on paper, and they certainly weren't the, the kinds of checks that we think about as checks today. They didn't have account numbers on them, for example. Uh, they would be referenced by surname and the address of the bank. It required a lot of clerks to work through the checks that will be deposited, uh, to process, to be acting as, as, as it were, information processors. And as these checks became more and more popular, Bank of, uh, Bank of America in particular, um, which was the high, uh, largest processor of these checks, was essentially getting to the point where they would have to close the bank for the majority of the day to cope with the number of checks that were deposited. There was a clear information overload situation. Um, he was involved uh, in what, shall we say, the second half of that, that process. Um, I can't remember if I've got a slide where I'll give more detail on that, but I suppose it doesn't matter as I'm running out of time anyway. But um, I will just point to the fact that there was very, a very interesting uh, thing that happened with um, when it was introduced. Is that, and it reminds me of uh, the sort of uh, Steve Jobs um, keynotes, but they did a kind of keynote around the banking system to present to uh, Bank of America, oh, Bank and America, Bank of America it should be. And uh, they, ha they couldn't get the system to work, so they had to have a human hidden behind a screen, um, making it look as if it were doing the processing that the Bank of America were going to pay a lot of money for, right? And that, that this notion of humans behind the technology is, of course, going to run through this entire talk. So uh, the second thing he did was um, he developed a um, very interesting piece of software called SLIP, a list processing uh, language, um, and he was recruited to MIT as a result of the publication of SLIP in 1963, I think it was, and re-implemented SLIP uh, as MAD SLIP. MAD, of course, was a computer system at MIT. And on MAD SLIP, he then wrote, of course, ELISA. We're very familiar with ELISA. And, 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 and isn't this just so uh, computational? Of course, there's another abstraction layer. ELISA itself ran scripts, and those scripts included, because there were a number of them, although we may not remember them, um, was Doctor, the one that gets completed with ELISA today. And of course, he then became a professor of, of computer science, tenure, and so on and so forth. So, he kind of lived the experiences of computation at this time, this question of automation, this uh, experience of the way in which computation could both create um, social conflict, shall we say, could create labor problems, could create uh, redundancies, and also problematize certain conceptions of what it is uh, to be human, what it is to be a professional, um, and certainly uh, this question of um, the kinds of intellectual capacities of a certain kind of class, I think, are you know folded into this discussion, which of course I won't have time really to go into here, and of course it returns later. But anyway, the thing is, is I think he drew on a number of these different influences and, and these experiences when he was raising these questions about human reason and. Uh, computation. Now, these, the return of Weizenbaum, you know, it's kind of interesting. It's a refrain from history, right? Why Weizenbaum? Why is he coming back? And I think there are, there are uh, deep resonances with where we are today, right? And I think this is, in some sense, twofold. Suddenly, we have another kind of automation anxiety emerging. 
with what we might call full-on cognitive uh, automation. This creates certain anxieties, certain questions about the limitations of computation. And again, you know, we see all these publications around the rise of the robots, the new intellectual capacities of machines, and the emergence of robotics as a real kind of uh, problematic for what were thought of as um, impossible to automate or um, uh, transform into uh, non-human form. But secondly, we also see, rather interestingly, the, the re-emergence of the text-based interface, right? I mean, there was always a kind of nostalgic refrain uh, in certain computational circles, but actually this is a, a much more uh, wider uh, introduction to a constituency of users of the wonders of text in terms of chats, etc. Now, of course, messaging, I suppose, and Facebook and so on and so forth also come into these kinds of domains. But I think what's interesting about Slack and its related uh, technologies is the way in which they function as a kind of personal assistant. They speak back. They take notes and record. And Slack has a number of um, uh, chatterbots, as they're now called, in as part of the system. And there's a whole API around producing these kinds of personal assistant technologies. There's a whole new class of corporations, no surprise, have launched around this kind of thing. So we've got X.A, AI, Clara, GoButler, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And on another level, we also see the, 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 the return of conversation as uh, oral conversation. So we get these interfaces, which are very similar in construction in terms of Siri, Cortana, Alexia, and Facebook M as well. And, um, you know, there's a kind of ironic uh, 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 content to Siri um, if you ask her, um, are you Eliza? Um, so... Um, this kind of question then and the return to Weizenbaum, I think, is very much set up in terms of the sudden um, uh, resonance of Weizenbaum's questions uh, and the way in which you frame those questions. Now, what I do want to do is point to the fact that's often forgotten in terms of Eliza is that 1966, you know, was different to 2016, right? No surprise. But the materiality of Eliza was also radically different, right? Eliza wasn't on a screen, right? We forget that. Eliza was actually a type system. It was a printed system. And I think that materiality of Eliza Doctor is absolutely crucial to understand why it was Eliza had the profound impact it did. There seemed to be something specific, perhaps, around the paper materiality. You know, you could... After you'd had the conversation, you could take it with you, you know, and think about what Eliza stroke doctor, because it was actually doctor, was doing. There's also, I think, oh, this is just an aside, there's also kind of, it's kind of interesting that there's a confusion over the history of Eliza, um, which computer it was implemented on, how many versions of Eliza there were. We don't have the source code for Eliza. It seems to have been lost somewhere along the lines. Um, so it's also interesting as an absence, I think. Now, the other thing um, that um, Nick Montford, for example, and it's also kind of implicit in Sherry Turkle's description, although she doesn't focus on this materiality, is these teletype systems were actually slow. You know, they printed one character at a time. So as you were talking to Eliza Doctor, you could see the conversation as it emerged. So there was a, a certain temporality, shall we say, uh, to these systems. Nate, how long have I got? Six minutes. Right, great. Okay, so I'm going to have to do quite a big jump because I really want to get to the second half of my talk. But I do just want to mention this for those that remember Fire, fire Sign Theatre. I don't know if anybody does. But um, the impact of Doctor was quite profound. Um, of course, it's one of those programs that many computer scientists implement themselves. It runs through culture in loads of interesting ways. And this Fireside Theatre one, I think, is, is particularly an interesting one. And it's well worth, uh, it's on YouTube, actually. It's well worth listening to um, because it was uh, a, a dystopian future where Eliza is the computer interface uh, uh, for a future uh, computation. Unfortunately, I haven't got time uh, uh, to talk about that. 
So I haven't got time to talk about uh, Wise Man's history either, nor show you, well, I will show you a wonderful photograph, but I can't talk about it, unfortunately. Uh, so what I would like to do, really, is to get to this section. So what I want to do now is connect this issue of what lies behind the interface, whether that interface be a printed interface or a screen-based interface, um, and think about this question in terms of really the way in which human reason raises a problematic for the kinds of, uh, not just experiences, but the kinds of processes, the kinds of relationships, perhaps, that we seek in these kind of uh, computational, conversational uh, moments. Now here, this is very much concerned with the question of, I think, cognitive labour, um, but it does relate to uh, lots of different aspects. I'm, I'm going to bring forward particularly the question of the proletarianisation of forms of knowledge, um, and also how this connects to a kind of routinization of thinking. And what I'm kind of pointing to is, in some sense, the failure of a lies adopted, the failure of artificial intelligence, the failures of computation, but also, in some ways, the way in which these systems are, and it's a question of whether this is temporary, and that's a big discussion, but the way in which these systems then seek to wrap human reason, and wrap human reason, and I'm using wrap in a technical sense, but discretize it, turn it into an algorithmic subsystem, and in some sense, reify human reason as an API that one can call, right? As, a, as I say there, a kind of unit of cognitive power. A unit of cognitive labor power, might be a better way to put it. Um, and yes, I've just said that. That's great. Um, so um, I'm going to look at um, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. There are a number of these different systems. It's well worth having a look at them because the way in which they're constructed is very fascinating. They call themselves micro-task systems. Um, again, I think that raises lots of interesting questions. There's lots of interesting work around this. The way in which labor um, is sold through these systems and re-articulated uh, as a uh, in some sense, radically elastic and radically unhuman in some sense as well. I think that's a, there's a whole interesting piece of work to be done around this question. And also to, to tie this into these questions of streams of consciousness, uh, they, they also uh, make the possibility of streams of labor power uh, on demand, um, which I think is very fascinating, very problematic, of course, about these systems. And the way in which they work through signal mechanisms Again, haven't got time to talk about that kind of stuff. Maybe that can affect questions. Um, but the way in which signals deployed in these systems is kind of very interesting. So I've probably got like two minutes left, so I'm going to dash through this stuff. Um, you're all very familiar with uh, 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 Amazon's Mechanical Turk, of course. Humans as a service. Um, this idea of somehow a uh, being able to create human intelligence tasks. These are the abstract units of cognitive labor, as it were that are sold for piecework. There's a whole uh, kind of problematic uh, um, issue to do with this. Um, but it is this wrapping of the problematic of the um, excess mm, of the uh, 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 outside, shall we say, of computation within computation itself that I'm trying to capture in, in this discussion. Mechanical Turk, you've all undoubtedly seen that photo, that uh, image. Um, so I won't, I won't go into that, but the idea really is it's a kind of trick, a sleight of hand, and mediates the labor that lies behind. Now, again, haven't got time, it's kind of terrible really, but it's this question of Wizard of Oz prototyping that I'm exploring, um, how Wizard of Oz prototyping as a particular way of designing these kind of systems becomes no longer a stepping stone onto full automation and full computation, but itself becomes a practice of implementation of submerging the human rationality within, or the specificity of the human rationality and reason within the computational systems. 
Now, the system I did want to talk about in some depth, but unfortunately just won't be able to, is this one, Soylent. So this was a very interesting uh, project uh, developed at MIT, uh, Soylent, a word processor with a crowd inside. And what's fascinating about this is the way it brings together and demonstrates in really interesting ways um, both, is that no more time? Okay, I'll just wrap up. Um, so I would say uh, it's definitely worth having a look at. Um, <laughs> uh, but what's fascinating is people writing documents, people word processing, essentially what you have is plugins that are farmed out to the mechanical Amazon Turk. They do very particular algorithmic tasks that word itself cannot function. It's all invisible to the user. You do not know how many people you farm this work out to. All you know is there's a pot of money that you're spending out there somehow, right? And that's only because it's a, a research project. Unfortunately, I can't show you any more detail about it. I would say go and have a look at it, and I'm certainly going to be publishing uh, a paper on this in the very near future, and you can find out more. Thank you. <laughs>